Welcome to the webinar, Top Technology Innovations Driving Growth in the Food and Beverage Industry. My name is Josh Haslin, Research Director here at Lux Research, and I'll be presenting today's session along with my colleague, Harini Venkataraman. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Harini Venkataraman, Analyst in the Agri-Food Team, leading our food and nutrition research. Really looking forward to the webinar today. Great, Harini. Thanks for joining me today. Now, throughout the webinar, you can type in any questions you have in the questions box on your screen, time permitting. Uh, we'll answer all the questions that we can. If you have questions that don't get answered, um, please do not hesitate to email us at questions at luxresearchinc.com and we absolutely will respond. Now, with that, uh, let's dive right into the webinar today. Uh, again, top technology innovations driving growth in the food and beverage industry. Today, we're gonna to be walking you through uh, a range of different uh, agenda items. And the first is gonna revolve around a river of choices and choice being a key disruptor for the industry. From then, we're gonna talk about this river of choices and, and think about the innovations that actually make your offering stand out you know, amongst the flow of choices, uh, uh, you know, kind of hitting consumers from every angle these days. And, and then lastly, we're gonna talk about some of the momentum along those innovations for B2B, B2C players, who's being successful in this, because I think we all know that there's a lot of failures going on too. And then we'll leave you with some few concluding remarks. So with that, Let's jump right into this river of choices as a disruptor. And so, you know, if you find me out in the weekend here in California, you'll, you'll probably find me out on a river like this, and I'll be I'll be fly fishing, trying to fool some uh, fly and or some fish into taking a fly for myself. But when I'm out here, I also think a lot about the job and then think about agri-food, think about the industry, and think about the changes. And when you think about this. Uh, you know, a trout and, and being barraged by choices of insects to eat is very similar to consumers and, and having industry, you know, within this flow, I think it's a, a really apropos. So, you know, breaking it down again, you know, we have this, this fish and this fish is very synonymous with what consumers are. You're a fish sitting in a, in a, in a raging river, right? And, and you kind of have this image that's similar to what you see on the right here. And that is a lot of things flying by you at once, right? And, and this is very, right, synonymous with what a consumer deals with on a day-to-day -day basis. A lot of what we're all dealing with in the CPG and, and, and food industry, thinking about how to get consumer to make that choice, to choose your product, pick it off the shelf. And we know that that's exceptionally difficult, especially as the food and beverage industry brings an ever-increasing diversity of products and ingredients to the market. And we know that that's coming from an increasing diversity of sources, right? So you, just like the picture on the right here, we have all sorts of new avenues that are adding to the pool, adding to the river and to that industry. And within that, right, we have smarter, smarter and more wily fish. And it's, it's very difficult, right? Those consumers, they're uh, always increasingly discerning. They're looking for outcomes and at the same time, right, still thinking about cost and it continues to drive things. So, you know, when you think about trying to capture those opportunities, those innovations, you have your competitors, you have the flood of well-funded purpose-built organizations, right? You have these often more agile, younger developers. And so you're a lot like these individuals on the stream, elbow to elbow, trying to come up with a new innovation, right? To fool that consumer and, and, and preferably not fool them, right? But to, to gain some loyalty with that consumer so that they do choose your product, so that they see the innovation there. But that really requires implementation of a range of strategies. And so amongst that range of strategies, it doesn't stop there, right? Um, you know, what's driving this uh, amount of innovation that we're seeing, well, it's this flood of choice that's also aligning with megatrends, right? We have changing consumer preferences that are really uh, affecting consumer behavior. Um, we have COVID, right, impacting how people think about uh, their health at home. We have regional food security and nations building different agendas around how they're going to produce food in the future, right? The EU um, being a, a prime driver of this. And then lastly, we obviously we also have urbanization continuing to play an important role in how people think about their day-to-day -day lives, how they engage with the food system, where they think about where their food is coming from, how far it needs to travel to get to them. So all of these things are lining together and really causing uh, a moment of uh, profound change and a big part of that change again as i said is is about diversification so here is where i want to bring my team member harini in, who's been doing just an amazing amount of work in this area thinking about drivers of change and, and trying to track this flooded choice and and harini 
when you think about this flooding choice and an alignment of key megatrends, what's the you know best example right now that really elucidates and, and, and demonstrates how these things are are colliding to date? Thank you, Josh. Uh, when you think about all of these convergence of megatrends, especially the sustainability imperative, a great example that jumps right on top of my mind is alternative proteins. Uh, in fact, this is a space that Lux has been following very closely. And over the past three to four years, we've seen a flood of choices. And when I mean that, I really say that it's a flood of choices uh, appearing in response to market demand, consumer changing preferences. Uh, some of these choices are uh, emerging and some of them are a bit more mature, I would say. But broadly speaking, we divide the alternative proteins into various categories, as you can see here. It can be plant proteins, insect proteins, fermentation-derived proteins, as well as algae and the more hot topic of cell-based meat. Uh, all of this is really you know, falling into the bigger bucket of alternative proteins. And what you see here on this protein production market map is definitely not an exhaustive list. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you just zoom in on a category like plant proteins, what we would end up seeing is really multiple options on different parts of this uh, value chain, I would say, be it on the crop production front or ingredients or the finished products. All of these developers, you know, what you see here is also emerging startups as well as bigger established companies, all of them vying for this market attention. Just goes on to show how complex and crowded this whole space is. And this is one of the examples I would say, uh, you know, talking about the multiple choices. And it's a very familiar example. Well, hopefully, you know, this goes to show perhaps some of the different ways that this diversity, this choice is happening, you know, whether it's crop production, whether it's finished products or ingredients. And so, so I think, yes, this is an absolutely great example. And it goes to show that, you know, this emerging choice means that differentiation is critical. So, you know, kind of moving forward, innovations are often how you make that offering stand out, but there's also a lot of different ways we can think about innovating and our team has, has thought a lot about this. And, and three areas that we have been focusing on recently are thinking about more of these alternatives, ones perhaps beyond plant proteins. Um, we've been thinking a lot about functional ingredients too, thinking about outcomes and, and modes of action and how being more certain in those is really driving change. And also thinking about maybe something a bit off the beaten track, these new channels that are emerging, digital technologies that'll enable you to capture new markets. And so you know, let's dive into these. I wanna start with alternatives here. And again, when we think about this, the common thing you hear is, you know, these disruptive alternative ingredients that align with consumer demands, sustainability initiatives. But, you know, here I'm, I'm showing you that you should also first perhaps even think about innovations in the existing sources that you have. And, and I just wanted to start with a, with a brief example here. And I focus a lot of my time on agri-innovation. And so when we think about alternatives, we can still think about existing uh, sources and how to innovate those to make them new alternatives. So for instance, you can, you can see our, our, our livestock on the right here. You know, what does it mean for dairy industry to remain competitive? Well, one big way that they can do that is by innovating in the methods they use to uh, monitor, ensure quality and improve performance of the livestock they have, as well as improving sustainability. So, you know, it's also imperative that when you think about alternatives, you think about alternative ways to, to boost existing products. Now, that's not necessarily the focus for today's talk. What I want to do is highlight what some of Harini has done around thinking about alternative sources and alternative production techniques. So Harini, could you kind of elucidate what, were, what are some of the key momentum areas that we're seeing in innovation around those two key areas? Absolutely, Josh. I think you brought a right point talking about the existing innovation for livestock agriculture. But when you look into alternative sources, we've actually witnessed incredible growth, I would say, especially um, thinking about plant proteins and newer types of plant proteins. Uh, we call it the second generation proteins. Pea, chickpeas and oats are some of the examples. Uh, where we stand currently in the industry, the commercial maturity level of these plant proteins is pretty high, and a lot of the players are actually now focusing on scale-up and expansion. Now, despite all of this commercial activity, what we still do see is that there is a wide space for innovation when it comes to improving the taste or texture or the organoleptic properties of existing plant protein products. And that's where we see categories like microproteins emerge. 
Now, this is again one of those alternative production methods that I'm, we're going to be discussing now. Uh, what you see on the right is our Lux technology signal, which helps to monitor the trajectory of technology innovation. Uh, in this case, we are really combining uh, data science as well as data from our patents, papers, and funding to give you a good you know, idea about how uh, particular technology is evolving over time. Now, interestingly, what you can see here is that there is growing momentum for microproteins. And in line with this, what we've been witnessing is over the past, I would say two to three years, a lot of startups have popped up in the space. And uh, thinking about the funding momentum, about half a billion dollars has gone into the space with companies like Nature's Find um, and a couple other players in Europe like Mush Labs and Protein Brewery, all of them raising this money. Um, and Broadly speaking, this alternative production would also encompass like fermentation derived proteins like what you see from Perfect Day and Motive Foodworks, for example. Now with so many of these categories, especially within the alternative protein space, uh, what companies need to do is really maintain the delicate balance, I would say, when you think about the incumbent ones and the emerging choices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, thinking about microprotein in general, obviously there's lots of applications for that. Just outside of creating ingredients. There's, there's lots of different ways to utilize those products to, to gain new feedstocks, gain new sources. So it's a really interesting area, one we are very excited about and, and are continuing to follow. Now, you know, kind of moving forward into uh, the next sector, functional ingredients, you know, here we're talking about ingredients that confirm health, uh, some form of health impact, right? And, and there's lots of ways to impact health of, of the consumer, you know, from metabolic to immune system to cognitive to microbiome. And, you know, we've been doing a lot of work here and, and just as kind of a shameless plug for some of our upcoming work, Karini's working on a, a very interesting report around microbiome modulation that should be um, hitting uh, shelves not too long from now. And so, you know, Harini, when you think about that and, and having dove deeply into this space, you know, what do you think the momentum around functional ingredients is and, and what are some key areas of um, innovation where you're seeing some impact happen? Yeah, overall, what we see is that the, there is this renewed interest, I would say, a momentum for functional ingredients, uh, especially that's tied tying into the consumer trend for you know, interest in health and wellness. And the COVID-19 pandemic has also par partly played a role there, I would say. As you rightly mentioned, broadly speaking, a lot of these functional ingredients can be categorized into the health impacts that they uh, confer. And in particular, for somebody who's been looking into this space for a while, I would say that this, um, the whole idea about microbiome modulation through probiotics and prebiotics and all of these biotic products that still interest is still there and it's one that is likely to grow. Uh, on the surface, you know, if you look into our Lux Tech signal on the right, it looks like the probiotic space is quite mature. And in fact, the interest is declining, which is reflective of the fact that there is a lot of acquisition happening, uh, market consolidation. Uh, about $1.5 billion has actually gone into the space for about, you know, in the past three years from 2018 to 2021, and mostly in the form of acquisition. Now, um, what's interesting to notice here is that while probiotics have always been associated with gut health applications, what we are witnessing now is really the emergence of novel application areas. You know, when you think about skin health, weight management, or mood management, um, and that's exactly what you see here. Uh, when you look into the tech signal for gut brain access, you can clearly see a surge in innovation interest there, which is indicative of the you know, number of patents and academic research going on there. We're still at the early stage there, but it's clearly these types of underlying applications that's creating a lot of industry momentum. Uh, and again, right. coming back to this, you know, wide range of choices, uh, there, are, there are other companies like Neritas and Brightseed and Carnagen, all of them working either on the ingredient discovery front or let's say scale up using fermentation methods. So there is like a wealth of choices here uh, for functional ingredients. Right. And it seems like, you know, the, the function, as you said, is really expanding rapidly. You know, the gut brain access, among others, that's the tip of the iceberg here. Right. Thinking about what these potential applications are now and, and, and considering what does it mean to have a, a mode of action that you truly do understand and what type of impacts you can make in the industry. So, so I think that's just a, a great take on this particular area. Now, lastly, we we've been thinking a lot about channels and thinking about 
you know, again, sticking to this idea of, of thinking of industry as a flow, we can always think of channels and, and those channels often take you to new markets or new ways to access um, individuals, perhaps in ways that you haven't interacted with before to, to really get your products there. And, and whether it's, you know, through areas like personalization, which often requires tagging digital technologies right onto some kind of ingredient in order to demonstrate the outcome or whether it's just using digital sales platforms to engage in new ways where perhaps um, you know technology is now available in regions where it wasn't available before or even you know direct to consumer sales this has become exceptionally important as you know we keep bringing up covid and and perhaps everybody's tired of it but it's changing our lives right and so it's it's very important so karini as if you thought about channels and, and some of the work you've done um, around innovation in the food and bev space you know what's the momentum look like and, and at what stage are we at really in this type of innovation driving change in the industry i think you brought up a great point there josh uh, adapting to new industry structures is not something which comes natural to food and beverage players i would say uh, and it's only creating a little bit of a challenge for them but to kind of look at it at a more let's say holistic approach in terms of all of these digital sales platform and d2, D2 c channels will actually mm -hmm. open up a lot more opportunities i would say uh, one such uh, interesting interplay is personalized nutrition. Uh, for instance, our team has been looking into that in many different ways. While there are a number of pitfalls which are possible, there are also opportunities because I know it continues to be an opt hot topic. If you think about companies like DSM investing about uh, 100 million directly into a startup called Hologram Sciences. So uh, what we see here is really the uh, convergence of the interest in personalization as well as the rising uh, D2C uh, channels, I would say. And we see that not only for the personalized nutrition um, area, but also really moving upstream uh, into digital sales platforms, for example. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, thinking about this and, and, and taking all of those different areas into context, you know, again, we're here we're highlighting kind of the some of maybe the key players, key acquisitions, but we haven't really talked about the success of those companies, right? And whether or not those those uh, ventures actually turned out and obviously DSM and, and Hologram, a very early uh, engagement there. So we're not sure how that's gonna play out, even though it's a pretty interesting bit of engagement here. So as you've thought about this, you know, what are the types of, <clears throat> or, or perhaps what are some good examples, Serini, of, uh, players who have had some success in this and perhaps if you can elucidate you know what their strategies looked like based on the types of technology innovations that we've talked about to date yeah no that would be my pleasure uh, in fact what i was thinking is to really quickly address three case studies for each of the technology areas we've been talking about today in particular if you look into alternatives and you know we've talked a lot about alternative proteins today i'd like to bring up this example of unilever um, and how Unilever's strategy of entering into the alternative protein space and growing in the space, that's quite interesting, I would say. It first acquired a plant-based meat analog company, which is actually a Dutch one uh, called the Vegetarian Butcher. But later on, it really partnered with other types of protein companies, right? Microalgae developers, uh, as well as more recently, it partnered with uh, a microprotein company, really spreading its bets on diverse protein sources. Uh, and going forward from our analysis, we do see that this is going to be a key strategy for CPGs, especially thinking about the future of proteins and how that's going to be a diverse mix of different types of protein sources. Right. So, so it's not about, you know, we hear protein and people pulling one protein or another, but it's about, you know, are you able to provide that range of, of benefits or, or choices again that people are looking for uh, because food is becoming more diverse and our diets are also becoming more diverse. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, I did have another one, which is really thinking about the functional ingredients. And personally, I've been following the space quite closely, and I'm very excited to see the kind of developments happening here. Um, traditionally speaking, developing a novel functional ingredients, for instance, if you're thinking about with, you know, a specific bioactive property, that's a really time-consuming process, and it often involves you know, long R&D cycles. Being a scientist myself, I know how difficult that is. Uh, what we're seeing here is really um, companies like Brightseed, uh, which are coming up with AI-based platforms and uses like a bioinformatics-based approach uh, to expedite that ingredient discovery. 
Uh, and this company recently partnered with Danan, I think uh, that's a great example to show how food and beverage companies should be thinking about the future of novel functional ingredients discovery. Uh, it also expedites the process, but also thinking about minimizing those downstream application risk. All right, absolutely. And, and you know, to, to that point in particular, you know, we don't see many companies doing this on their own, right? This is just not something that's that that's really possible. And, and the way it happens internally, right, is is exceptionally well-trained individuals and, and exceptionally difficult and, and perhaps often lucky uh, management processes. And now we've seen Brightseed be successful a, a few times. So that's a great example, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, to your point, uh, partnerships are gonna be a key um, piece in terms of achieving that success, right? You can't do that all by yourself. That's, that's a great point you brought. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, I think I would love to talk about one interesting case study, which is touching upon this intersection of personalization and D2C channels that we've been talking about. Uh, a startup that really stands out here is LifeNome, uh, which is providing personalized health recommendation based on genomic data, as well as other types of data streams. And interestingly, what is differentiating LifeNome from other players is this targeted consumer base. So they're starting with maternity health, with pregnant women health, uh, and they are trying to expand that to other types of consumer bases. This is a great example in terms of bringing in this novel D2C channel, but at the same time taking a targeted approach here. Uh, it did win a grant from PepsiCo's Green uh, Accelerator. I think uh, going forward, we're gonna see a lot more of these type of collaborations for mm -hmm. food and beverage companies. They're traditionally not seen uh, a lot of those uh, partnerships, I would say, uh, but we will see uh, you know, companies trying to analyze multiple consumer data streams and how they can, you know, create these new avenues out of that. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we think about <clears throat> what we define as health and at risk. And, and I feel like, you know, one thing that's happening is uh, within these, we're seeing uh, sort of that at risk population grow because we are at risk for lots of different reasons, but it's about being uh, able to demonstrate that confidently. And I think this is, as you said, a really nice example of how you can create a target uh, population and, and then develop something that's very explicit and, and specific to them. So that's a really great example, Harini. Now, you know, thinking about this and, and thinking about everything you just said, you know, I hopefully, you know, the thing we've heard is kind of diversity, diversity, diversity keep coming through. But, you know, as far as three conclusions to leave you all with today, Again, the first thing is that what we're seeing in the industry is that this choice, this diversification is really driving uh, the food system competition. And so food and beverage companies, you're all up against uh, the fence trying to come up with new ways to diversify so that you can continue to compete. And, and hopefully, you know, some of the examples today that we've presented indicate that you have lots of choices. There, there's, there's many emerging companies that are, are continuing to generate new innovations that are actually making a significant change and, and aligned with these mega trends, you know, the money is there for them to push these solutions there. So you do have options out there. Um, however, I think the second uh, takeaway is, is, is really important uh, as well, where you're thinking about expect a variety of solutions that are going to require timing to succeed. So don't necessarily expect one particular solution to, to necessarily be enough for you to succeed right now and in your final example and the uh, the one around you know thinking about uh, bright seed are are really good examples of this you know needing to step outside your box to say you know this is something we definitely can't do alone but there are those who have the tools to do this you know that is a really important uh, technology to utilize and then lastly you know that interplay is absolutely crucial when when thinking about combining towards any type of personalization strategy, it's it's highly unlikely that you will use just one solution, right, to get there. You're going to need a D2C channel. You're going to need to be interacting. You're gonna to need to demonstrate the outcomes of your product. So if this is your goal, that interplay is gonna be absolutely critical uh, to get there. So hopefully, you know, the discussion between Harini and myself helped you think about this in, in a new and novel way so that now you can, you know, go ahead and, and think about a little more critically um, what you can do to participate in this flood of choice, as I said, as consumers need to make that final decision around whether or not it's your product, right, or, or your competitors, or perhaps some new young startups uh, to choose from. Um, so with that, you know, thanks very much, Rini, for joining me today. It's always great to be able to chat with one of the team members, you know, outside in the kind of this fun space. So, so I really appreciate you joining today. Uh, we'll now be taking questions 
uh, that you may have on the presentation, which you can type in the question box. Uh, if we don't get to your question again on the call today, uh, someone from Lux will be in touch in the webinar. So, so with that, let me go ahead and um, take a look at some of the questions that we have. So, so first, Harini, we have, um, what is the role of ingredient sourcing in the future of alternatives? So we talked a little bit about alternatives. We didn't get uh, too deep into ingredient sourcing. We were talking more about the innovations, but what's your perspective there? Um, what, how should, how should uh, individuals out there be thinking about ingredient sourcing for the future of the food system? I think that's a great question. I mean, if you're in the food and beverage value chain, I think ingredient sourcing is such a key part of your sustainability initiative, I would say. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me give you an example of what's happening around palm oil. That's something which we get asked from a lot of our clients. If you're looking at the palm oil supply chain that's under such an increased scrutiny, and uh, what we see is that there is a need for improved uh, traceability and transparency around the supply chain. Um, a lot of the existing players are already looking into that, but what I find fascinating is also the emergence of uh, alternatives, so, which we've been talking about. So really thinking about emerging technologies um, like the one uh, C16 Biosciences is a startup which is working on fermentation derived palm oil. Um, although this is kind of at the early stage, I would say, because you know scale up is kind of a big yeah, challenge for a lot of these startups. Right. Um, it is still interesting to see that these alternatives are going to gain importance as we just, you know, go past that hurdle, I would say. Uh, for now, I think uh, improving sustainability to existing palm oil value chain that could be through traceability, digital traceability measures, I think that's where we see from a lot of big players like BASF, for example. Right, right, right. And, and sort of, you know, to that end, you, you know, there's, we see both innovations in existing production, as I had brought up before, around how we produce palm oil, right? There's a lot of different initiatives out there to to kind of improve the way palm oil is produced. Obviously, it's a major staple and, and just converting overnight to any type of biotechnology is going to be incredibly difficult. And so, you know, it is important to think about those two and then also think about what the actual outcomes and benefits are. And, and that's the one thing I think I would add here, Harini, uh, and my thoughts from the ag perspective is, is as you go and think about your sources and you go to convince individuals uh, the market that your source is, let's say, alternative in that it is an improved method of producing existing or you know, completely alternative in a new uh, production method, you know, how are you actually communicating what this thing does and, and what types of metrics are you using to do that? This is becoming an incredibly important uh, piece of the puzzle as well. Yeah. Now, uh, let's see, we, we have had another question come in here. Um, this one is more around the value chain, so less about necessarily just the source, but more thinking about the value chain. How broadly should we be thinking about our value chain? You know, how how long should we be thinking about it? You know, how far ahead, how far upstream, how far downstream should we really be considering this? Wow, that's a great question for our team. Actually, you know, the way our agri-food team actually looks into it is really from the upstream and downstream angle. Um, but what I would like to say is typically a lot of the food CPGs are really looking into the key product attributes, which are connected to nutrition enhancement or other types of sugar reduction, salt reduction, and all of these measures. Mm -hmm. But what's getting increasingly important is really looking at the upstream part of the value chain. So think about resource efficiency, um, and tying that to the sustainable farming practices and this whole emergence of regenerative uh, farming, I would say. And that's where a lot of food and beverage uh, uh, companies are also investing quite a bit of their efforts there. Uh, and an example is PepsiCo, which I think announced about uh, 7 million acres of regenerative uh, farmland. Um, that's that's pretty you know, new in 2020. Uh, we see uh, some more of these CPGs entering the landscape uh, for regenerative farming. Um, and more downstream, what we see is also like really related to sustainable packaging and creating the roadmap for um, you know, sustainable uh, packaging materials and plastic recycling. Now, all of this is really getting that interest in the value chain, I would say. Right, right. And, and just to kind of you know, tag on to what you're bringing up around regenerative, since this is a, a key topic for our team this year, and, and we've been thinking a lot about you know, what does scaling uh, regenerative um, value chains actually look like, and, and how ready or how ready is our agriculture system, you know, to to actually implement those types of things. And I think this is the major challenge, and it's great to see, you know, companies like you said, PepsiCo, General Mills, thinking about this, beginning to um, expand what it is to understand regenerative practices, to actually implement them and to convert you know, away from, let's just say, a standard organic 
practice to something that is uh, regenerative and, and to that end what does regenerative mean and so you know this is a question I think that is on the minds of many companies and, and once you do claim that something is regenerative how do you demonstrate and it goes again back to thinking about metrics in this case it's more about um, demonstrating the regenerative change you make right what's your existing state and how do you move from that existing state to a, a new state and then tie that right to your product so this is I mean this is the challenge we're at so you know it's great to see 1 million, 7 million acres. This is still a, a drop in the bucket and it's a drop in the bucket because companies are, are, are going through the process of figuring out how to demonstrate uh, that this type of regenerative practice can actually be scaled and then also right, can, can have some attachment of information to it around the, the scale of change that you actually do see. So lots of challenges there. It's super exciting though, when we are really thinking about, you know, what types of technologies can innovate uh, to enable these things in the future, because, you know, in talking with groups like, for instance, the Rodale Institute, you know, their groups who are developing a regenerative certification, you know, and in our conversations with them, they've said the, the, the primary piece of uh, technology to facilitate this is, is actually digital technologies that monitoring is, is absolutely critical. And coming from a, a group like the Rodale, that's I think a very uh, prominent bit of knowledge to show where it's going in the future. So so yeah, I, I totally agree, Ernie. Very interesting, um, lots of challenges, but but we're really excited to be a part of the, the system right now. As I said, you know, this this bit of change is happening and it's happening today and and um, we are we are in the flow. And so you know capturing that's really difficult. Exactly. I mean, it's the best time to be working in the agri-food sector, I would say. There is a lot of challenges, but that's opening up opportunities and it's kind of creating this whole uh, technology-led approaches, I would say. Absolutely. And uh, so so with that, uh, again, Harini, thanks for joining. Um, that's going to conclude our webinar for today. The slide presentation and recording from this webinar will be sent to all attendees uh, via email. And additionally, we, we want to tell you all to check out our upcoming webinars. So you can see in the top left here, we have a list of those webinars. Um, and, and also at the very bottom left, you can see we have more information about this year's Lux Executive Summit. And, and, and just to let you know a little bit more, we will be talking about some of the topics that we've said here. Sustainability is a key driver for what we're gonna be presenting at the Lux Executive Summit. So if you're interested in regenerative, if you're interested in some of these uh, challenges and innovations that we've talked about today, please do join us. You know, uh, This is our 17th annual event and it is taking place the first week in October. So, so thank you all again for joining and hopefully look forward to seeing you at the Lux Executive Summit 2021. Thank you. Thank you, Josh, and thank you so much for your attention. Absolutely.